Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> um, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to Broadview's National Online Reading Club. My name is Jocelyn Bell, and I'm the editor and publisher of Broadview. And working behind the scenes, as always, to help me out tonight is Sharon Doran, and she is Broadview's promotion manager. We're so glad that you're here, that you've taken an hour on a summer evening to be with us, and uh, we look forward to our discussion tonight. I am speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, Toronto is home to many, including diverse urban Indigenous uh, community of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. We would love to know where you're from. Please say hello from your hometown in the chat space. If you're part of a faith community and want to add that as well, please do so. And if you want to add your own land acknowledgement from wherever you are, I invite you to share that as well. It's just great for us to get to know each other all a little bit better. Um, a few technical notes before we get started. I want you to know that we are recording this session so we can share it with others. If you feel uncomfortable with your thumbnail video appearing in the video, then just please turn off your video now. Also, please mute your audio or we may mute it for you. Uh, but do turn on the chat function. For those who don't know how, you just hover your cursor over the bottom of the screen and the chat button will appear and click on that. It looks like a speech bubble. I also re recommend that you use the speaker view rather than the gallery view to enjoy tonight's event. There's a spot in the top right corner of your screen where you can click on speaker view and that's the best way to, uh, to be engaged with our speakers. This evening, we're going to hear from Natika Bach, Louise Kinross, and Andrea Irwin, and they are all writers and story subjects from our September issue of Broadview. But before we get started, I'm very pleased to announce that we have a sponsor for this evening's event. The United Church uh, Bookstore is our partner in bringing the Reading Club to you tonight, and bookstore manager Rebecca Hornberg is here to say a few words. Uh, Rebecca, are you all set to say a few words? Please welcome Rebecca. Good evening, everyone. I am so excited to be attending this event together with all of you. My name is Rebecca Hornberg, and I'm the manager for the United Church Bookstore, ucrdstore.ca, and I am very excited to be partnering with Broadview. I'm not sure how many of you who have visited our bookstore in the past, but I thought that I would very quickly just uh, share my uh, screen with all of you and show us that we are actually carrying the, um, the book following that um, uh, our uh, author, Andrea Irving, who we will be hearing from in a little bit has written. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Here it is. So this is the United Church Bookstore, UCRD. And um, I also wanna make a little bit of a shout out of our uh, clearance section. I know I'm among <laughs> book people. And if you type in following here in the search box, you would be able to find the book following and i am sorry about that guys there we go here we are and i'm also excited to share a code with you tonight so if you type in bv for broadview following when you check out you will get 15 percent off your purchase so I will type in the code in our chat box and the link to the store. And I also want to thank Jocelyn for inviting us to sponsor tonight's event. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the evening. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And we'll post that uh, link again and the code um, after Andrea has spoken as well. So we'll get it up there twice and you won't miss it. Uh, one final note before we begin, after our speakers have told us a little bit about themselves and their stories, there will be about 10 minutes for questions. And please do ask questions. We're, we'll have a much more vibrant conversation if there's lots of participation. 
and uh, people want to hear from readers, not just from me. So please, uh, please jump in with your questions and have them ready to go. Um, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to Natika Bach. Natika is a community services coordinator for the Tecumloops to Sequetmic First Nation and a Master of Divinity student with the Vancouver School of Theology. She identifies as German, English, Irish, and Anishinaabe, and has extensive experience working for Indigenous communities and organizations and developing, developing cultural safe programs and indigenizing curricula. Natika lives in Kamloops, BC with her daughter Eden and partner Mike Alexander, who has been at our uh, reading club twice in the past. In our September issue, Natika wrote about her experience of working at the site of the former Kamloops Residential School, where the remains of over 200 children in unmarked graves were confirmed in May. In her piece, she implores church members to take meaningful action. And please join me in welcoming Natika Bach. Hi, everybody. My name is Natika. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Um, and I'm just going to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of Tacoma's to Shikwetmik within the Shikwetmik Ulu. I just finished work, and I am the community services coordinator here in Kamloops. So I'm not too sure exactly what you would like me to talk about, but um, what exactly would you like me to say? Because I'm thinking I can do just kind of briefly talk about the article a little bit, but I think this topic really is better with conversation. Like, I feel like we've talked about reconciliation a lot. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I often like to reframe it as reconciliation, but even now I'm thinking it needs some new terminology. Would, would you like me just to kind of review why I was inspired to write it and go from there? Sure, that okay. would be great. Good. Uh, also, we have a new puppy and he just came in. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so basically um, on May 27th, 2021, we got the news as staff probably around two o'clock in the afternoon that they had found over 200, they said 215, that number's changed just a little bit since then, children buried in unmarked graves on our work site. So I work at the previous school. We were one of the schools that's still intact. I work in the previous girls wing on the bottom floor where they had recreation. And so we have quite a few floors. There would have been dormitories on the other floors. And then on the other side of the building uh, is the boys' wing. And then we also have another building beside the, it's called um, the Cheap Louis Center now, our building. But then the other one, we call it the admin building. And that one is the previous day school building. So these buildings are made for children. You can tell all the doorknobs are quite low. Um, you can still, like they're worn out on the, the floor. Kamloops Indian Residential School was one of the busiest schools in the 1950s. It had over 500 students enrolled. And the doorknobs are low, the mirrors are low, everything's low, it's dark, it's old, like it's really old. It, it, there was a fire at one point, but then they reconstructed it, so it's brick. There's um, crosses built into it, that kind of thing. And so you can imagine going to seminary in an environment like that. I've been home, mostly home work, working remotely since the beginning of COVID and I'm grateful for that. But the area where the children were found, I was aware of that area before, it's called the orchard. And it's where they also have um, ancient kakulis, which are the pit houses for these dugouts. And so I used to walk around there all the time because uh, we're right along the river and th there's not really much else to do, I guess. So I'd walk through there quite a bit and I noticed in the fall there are these huge apples and I noticed no one picked them. So I went back and asked someone, asked why, and they said, oh, we don't eat those apples because there's rumors that there are children buried there. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, got it. So the bears eat the apples, but that's it. So when I got the news, um, I 
like we found out two hours before the world found out. So we didn't have a lot of time to process. And um, like, I couldn't understand what my manager is saying. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Just like, <laughs> we mean children, we mean, and, and when it hit me, it was just devastating. And I work with several members of the Tecumlux community who are part of that legacy. So it was extremely devastating for them too. And I just had a conversation with uh, my coworker on Friday, and he's a third generation survivor of Kamloops Indian Residential School. And he was talking about how his grandma went and then how she went back to work there. And I'm like, yeah, and weird, because now your mom works here and you work here. Like, it's just this weird, like, ongoing thing. And, and, and so anyway, um, it took me a long time to write that article. So I reached out to uh, Reverend Dr. Ross Lockhart first at uh, the Dean of St. Andrews Hall in Vancouver, and because I needed to process it. Like, and, and for some reason I had this idea that we were gonna, so I started journaling kind of daily what was going on, lots of people coming in, that kind of thing. And then we were hit with wildfire season here in Kamloops. So we've been at ground zero. So that's why I'm like, I don't even know where to start because finally the wildfire stopped about a week ago. But Lytton burnt down. That's a little community an hour and a half away. We've had fires all around Kamloops and it's just been relentless on the community. So what had happened was that uh, not that same area, but the arbor, the powwow grounds, was a fire evacuation zone for BC. So just as we were trying to wrap our heads around what was going on, that happened. So this is, so I had to reread the article today to remember what was happening because we've had so many happenings here. Um, but basically this really hit home, not, well, first of all, there's a burial site on my, on my, we're an unburied, um, oh yeah, Richard Waganese. Yeah, he was a friend of mine. He's was here in Kamloops before he passed away. Um, basically there's a, a a burial ground on my work site. So that's a, that's impactful. That's not usual. But ironically, where my church is, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Kamloops, they have one too. And so they did this similar technology about a year ago and um, found like over a thousand bodies of, of men. So this is where the lost men uh, were buried, like homeless men, marginalized men, all of that many, many years ago. So I was like, weird, <laughs> you know, and, but, um, and then also my daughter's a third generation survivor of Alberni Indian Residential School in Port Alberni. So that school was started by the Presbyterian Church and then uh, United Church of Canada took it over in 1925. Mm -hmm. So there started those investigation at uh, Tishot First Nation and, and it's big, like it's heavy, it's heavy, heavy. So, um, so I had to write it to process it. It took about a month to write and it just felt like things were moving really fast. And I finally kind of landed at that and just really started to feel like this was like not a, not to sound like prophetic, but it was going to happen to other communities. Then it happened to Kawasis First Nation, mm -hmm. um, to um, Tanaha First Nation, to Penelicate First Nation, right? Like it just started happening. So I was trying to, in a way, use it as the opportunity not to exploit it, but to get people ready because it feels awful when it's in your own community. Hmm. And, you know, how, what have we done? Have we reached out to Indigenous people? I can tell you, I, I was reached out by my, by our principal, um, Reverend Dr. Richard Toppings. I talked to my minister about it, Pastor Steve Phillick and to, to Ross. But I can say that my daughter, who is Hewitt First Nations, never had any wraparound services from school, mm. other than orange t-shirts, which mm -hmm. is, that's not something, right? So uh, I guess it is, but not when you're Indigenous, it's triggering. So it was just trying to figure out ways like to keep the thoughts and prayers um, to minimum, but not to disregard them, but to really also focus on the other aspects of self besides spirituality. Like I'm thinking about Walter Brueggemann and how he talks about the whole embodied action-oriented Christian. So I, I kind of added that into my article.
just about how we can start moving forward on this. Like this conversation has been going for six years. It's not new information. It was predicted in the TRC. And so at times I was like, am I more angry that, like, why am I shocked? I knew this, like, it's just, there's so much to process. So, so I'm trying to, you know, just figure out a way to, to get more people aware of the pain, what it feels like, and just start asking some really good questions that are hopefully useful. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. That's and I'm assuming you read the article, but I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah. I want to definitely open uh, the floor for questions. And I think Brenda's is more of a comment than a question, so we'll just let it sit. Uh, while we're waiting for others to come up with some ideas, um, I'm curious to know what it's like now. I know, I know right after the news was announced and there was a lot of people coming and uh, putting displays of, uh, well, orange shirts and small shoes and things like that. What's it like there today? It's still pretty busy with people. So we went from being this kind of unknown community to being very, like people will come deliberately here just to go to the memorial. There's been a, a memorial in front of the, the old, it's also called the Red Brick Building, the old residential school. So people started putting items around there. Um, but we have lots of people around that we don't recognize. Um, we don't have as much media anymore, but if you would drop in before, you'd have cameras and, and people asking where the site is. It's been blocked off since the beginning, so I haven't even seen it. But I do know that it's the orchard, which is grass with white pegs in the ground. So also just to put it to understand, like they've really only investigated two acres out of, I have to find the numbers, but like 1% of the acreage. So there's a lot mm -hmm. more investigating to do. So, um, and right now they just uh, spent August, we have what are called 13 grassroots families. So each family had a, had a day to go. Um, there's more than 13 families, but a week, or I guess a day, and then they go down and have traditional and like um, psychological healing there available to them. So that's been done uh, and that's been really good for them to see it. And I guess it's just like when they go down, they're not prepared. Like they think they're prepared, but they're not prepared for mm -hmm. what they see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk. You, you may mention of the TRC, and of course, in the TRC, uh, it mentions that that children died in residential schools. Uh, mm -hmm. We know from listening to Indigenous survivors of those schools that they have, have often said that there were people who were who died, and they weren't really listened to. Um, so, what's it like? I mean, you know, we've tried to use in our our language in talking about this not use the word discovered because that doesn't feel like the right word. We've tried to use the word confirmed where we can. Uh, what's it been what's it been like for the people who are saying yeah we've been telling you all along <laughs> well that's interesting because I, I tried to find it again the article that I saw a couple of weeks after the the children were, were found or confirmed and it was an article from 19 something I think 97 where and it was a countless article where they published around the these these burial sites and and the catholic church denied it so there's been just a lot of like when you look back on it historically and like it's just like not even it's like pretty modern history like my daughter's grandfather is a survivor and he's also the chief of Huayat first nations he's alive and well you know but so for them it's really um, maddening it's like a lot of for my, for me as a witness, it's been like um, just trying to offer as much grace as possible because it is so confusing to be told you're lying because they were told they were lying, they told that they were wrong, these are false memories, you know, on and on and on. And like, um, so the first, you know, it would now it's like it's great to be believed, but there's a lot of anger, a lot of sadness, a lot to process. And, and the, the irony of this, and not the irony, but the what adds to the complexity is we also have a, a church, St. Joseph Catholic Church on reserve. Mm -hmm. And that church was pillaged in the 80s, I remember it, because um, I went by it a few times. And 
just nailed up all of that and the community gathered because there's quite a few Catholic practicing Catholics in the community and they refurbished the whole thing. So they got it all together. So the first thing that happened was it was vandalized. It wasn't burnt out, it was vandalized. And so we have security there all the time now, but that was just added to the game. It really did. Like it just added to that um, suffering that was already happening. They were just thinking like, so some of the Catholics, and, and I'm not, this isn't to um, undermine anything. I don't mean it like that, but one of the questions that I'm curious about is how are we also supporting some of the practicing Catholics in community? And so, because it's, you know, they knew all the stories and I've heard stories. I can't repeat them because they're not mine, but they're horrific. Like they're just horrific. And, you know, to be called liars and all of this. And then, um, and then also now to, to, they kind of feel like they have to hide. Yeah. Because they, they, they've managed that you, some people have been able to integrate both the traditional to come loops ways of knowing with Catholicism. So, yeah. So, and then there was also talk about vandalizing the school. Um, but there's, uh, yeah. So I don't know. It'd be hard to vandalize. It's like brick. Like, yeah. But you know, yeah. like everything's in there still. Like they, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I just wanted to, um, uh, we've got a comment from Ray LeBeau who says, I lived in Inuvik in the late 60s and se early 70s. There were two residential schools in town, Grawlier Hall and Stringer Hall. I heard stories about children being forcibly removed from their moms and dads, and I could not wrap my head around how that must have felt. I still have difficulty trying to imagine the hurt over the last number of years. There still remains a lot of work to build healthy relationships with those who are affected. Can, can you talk about, um, maybe just bouncing from that about building better relationships. You talked about, you know, your daughter, they didn't really uh, reach out enough. What, what are some effective ways for people who want to do that without becoming a burden? Right, so, um, so yeah, and I'll just like, I, I just pulled up my article again, just so I can look at it. But yeah, these are these stories, uh, and I'm just thinking too, as I read this comment by Ray, is that, What's going to, I think, change is that we're talking more about a genocide now, whereas up until now, it was always talked about as a cultural genocide, but these findings are real game changers. So these stories about children being forcibly removed is, is it's just like consistent. So what I had written as constructive ways of doing it was, has your church reached out to Indigenous members or local Indigenous communities to offer support and resources? Has your church and community talked about the discovery at Kamloops Indian Residential School and gone over what was learned from our experience? Is your church ready to implement the relevant calls to action? Is your church preparing for a time when more unmarked graves are found in either community or on site run by your Christian denomination? So these are questions to ponder, mm -hmm. but um, I was just going to say something. So one of the things that I had in the article was a saying that an elder, Butch Dick from Songhees First Nation in uh, Victoria, had told me, you listen twice, you speak once, listen twice. And so listen, listen, listen has been what I keep hearing over the last couple of months as, as, as advice from Indigenous people. But then this week ross was preaching at our church and he brought up james 119 you must understand this my beloved let everyone be quick to listen slow to speak slow to anger and i was like whoa that's exact like it's it's like almost exact right like this um listen 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 like there are uh, I read in our I read up here somewhere around from Carolyn Fraser around money. Uh, I need to think about that a bit. The uh, federal and provincial governments have committed monies to this, and I I could find out where else to send money. But there's going to be so many um, confirmations over the next few years, right? And so, but I think again, just recognizing. Um, have you reached out? Like how many churches are in just in this group have indigenous people in their congregation? And my guess is not too many. It's yeah. just my guess. 
<laughs> like, we're gonna we're gonna leave it. So we're gonna need to leave it there. Uh, thank okay. you so thank much, you. Natika, not Natika. Sorry about that. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, listen, listen, listen. I like that a lot. And yeah, uh, yeah that's great. Thank um, you so we're much. going, and I hope you'll stick around because I'm sure people have lots of other uh, questions and things for you. Oh, yeah, I'll be uh, right here. Great. Um, so we're going to continue listening, a different kind of listening, with Louise Kinross. Um, Louise is a special projects manager at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto, and she's the editor of Bloom, which is the hospital's blog on parenting children with disabilities. Her stories about parenting a son with a rare genetic, genetic disorder have been picked up by the New York Times, the Walrus, Huffington Post, and now Broadview. In our September issue, Louise wrote about growing up in the Christian science faith and all the conflicting and harmful messages about the body that she's grappled with since that time. Please join me in welcoming Louise. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. So yes, um, my story was about belief systems, religious, economic, medical, and how they view the body. And it began with my childhood in Christian science, which is a new thought religion uh, founded in the 1800s in Boston. In our religion, the body wasn't real because our true nature was spiritual. And we believed that the universe was governed by a holy good God. And that by understanding our spiritual perfection, we could heal ourselves of illness. So in my article, I then contrasted that with the ideas I studied in university that were extremely different, that basically um, we lived in a random world with no larger purpose and that humans were no different than animals and that um, our worth is determined by what our body can produce in a capitalist market. And at the time, those ideas led to a crisis of faith uh, for me. And then finally in the story, um, I talked about how my son was born with disabilities and I looked at how medical science sorts the body into two categories, normal and abnormal, and rejects the latter because its goal is to cure or prevent disease. So I think Jocelyn, you wanted me to talk about how I came to Broadview. So um, initially I contacted you through one of my mentors, the science writer, Alana Mitchell, who is also a Broadview writer. And Alana had um, suggested reaching out and she said that Jocelyn was one of the best editors in the country. Um, so Jocelyn very kindly read some swatches of my writing and it was her idea to focus the piece on the body as a theme that would run through three key periods in my life. And she thought that readers would be intrigued with the Christian science notion that the body is unreal. I found the editing process at Broadview to be tremendously helpful. Jocelyn said we would go back and forth on the piece over a number of weeks until we were both happy with it. And that's exactly what we did. And it was such a privilege to have your eyes um, on my writing and for you to help me structure the story. And Jocelyn really pushed me when she felt that parts of the piece weren't up to snuff to go back and rework them. Um, and that made a huge difference. And the story then benefited from an editing by Christy to tighten it up and a, and a rigorous fact checking uh, process. So I felt that Broadview brought so many resources to the table to make the story the absolute best that it could be, um, including having a fabulous co cover illustration and the photos inside, and that gave me a lot of confidence. In terms of reaction to the article, um, since it was published, it prompted a huge discussion on a Facebook group for ex-Christian scientists that I'm a part of, and there were 75 comments on the story, and I just wanted to share one that sums up um, many of the sentiments, quote, you articulated our shared experiences so beautifully. You have no idea how healing articles such as these can be, unquote. 
Um, I also heard from Mo Wright. I'm not sure if you know him, but he's one of your readers. <laughs> and um, it was really interesting. I met him in 2013 at a disability conference in Ottawa. We're both, uh, we both have children with disabilities. Um, and so it, just, I, it was very unexpected that he sent me a very nice email and let me know that he was a Broadview reader um, and that he had found the piece enlightening. And then I had a lot of positive response on my social media. Um, and I'm really grateful that Broadview, um, as a United Church publication, was willing to give a forum to my story because I wasn't sure that it would find a home in the mainstream. And then Jocelyn, you asked us to talk about what we hoped readers um, of the pieces might learn or do. And I would love for my piece to inspire people to look more closely at their own belief systems and how they may um, oftentimes I think at an unconscious level, exclude or marginalize certain people. So what I found interesting when I was writing the piece was that Christian science and medicine appear to be opposites, but they both have a concept of perfection that excludes people with disabilities. So in Christian science, a disability is unreal because God didn't create it and it stems from an incorrect belief in the material world and, and we can heal it by changing our thoughts. And in medicine, a disability is considered a failure um, of science because the goal is to cure or prevent uh, disease or disability. Um, and then to kind of tie it into religion as a whole, historically religion has played a role in blaming mothers for their children's disabilities. And often families um, of disabled children haven't felt welcome in certain faith communities. For example, there was a media story last year about a family in New Jersey who were told that their son who had autism couldn't participate in his first communion. Um, so I guess my greatest hope would be for readers of my story to look at the ways, to look closely at the ways that their belief systems may be based on some of these rigid black and white ideas um, that aren't inclusive. And oftentimes we're not even really aware of some of these ideas because they kind of sit below the surface of our thought. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was an excellent summary. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so I am going to ask you one. Um, your work at Hall and Blurview Re a Rehabilitation Hospital uh, now you're working in communications, but they have a different philosophy. They have a very positive ways of talking about disability. Can you just tell us a little bit about what, you know, you've, you've told us a bit about what's, what doesn't work and what's um, marginalizing, but what's, what's the better way? What do they do? Well, they, they tend to adopt the social model of disability. So as opposed to in medicine where disability is seen as a defect, um, they look at how our built environment and our attitudes actually shut out people from everyday life uh, and marginalize people and, and that really it's not so much uh, the disability in the person, it's more kind of the way we've structured the world for people with certain bodies, minds and behaviors and anyone who doesn't fit into those categories is really excluded, that that's really what the problem is. Yeah, and so, and so, and it also kind of looks at disability in a richer way as being an opportunity to adapt. So, um, you know, people with disabilities often are able to find other ways to do things. Um, and so they may be doing them a bit, a bit differently, but, um, they're still able to have rich lives. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have a question from Michael. I'm just gonna let you go ahead, Michael. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Louise for the story and for joining us tonight as well. Uh, I know something that struck me when reading it was um, coming up on the segment where talking about your, your childhood injury there and then uh, the nurses from this uh, sort of practice uh, getting involved with, with bandages and cleaning up the wound and that sort of thing. And it struck me that that is of course a form of you know, medicine in and of itself and sort of a technological intervention. And it also reminded me of um, a comment from a recent uh, service just this past Sunday about engaging people with vaccine hesitancy that has sort of a religious basis and approaching it from the perspective that, you know, it's sort of a God given gift to have the, the, the ability to figure out vaccines and how to administer that kind of system. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how someone 
uh, sort of a proponent of this perspective would engage with that kind of apparent contradiction or what their stance on that would be? Well, I think, um, I think one of the problems with Christian science is this huge um, separation of the physical and the spiritual and how it doesn't really speak to the human experience. Um, in Christian science, if, if you uh, are practicing it as you are supposed to, and if, and if you're aligning yourself with the so-called truth of the religion, um, it should be that you don't have uh, physical disease or other problems because the idea is that, you know, our God is wholly loving and good and would never create any of these um, problems that seem to be a part of life. So it, um, it creates this idea that the quote unquote normal life should be completely harmonious so then you're always coming up against this with you know the suffering that um that is universal but in our in our religion we're 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 claiming that that actually isn't reality that that's a misunderstanding and that that results from being separated from god's love and that if we really understand our connection always to God that um, we can be healed of those problems so I think um, it's interesting because yes they do the the nurses I mean they don't do anything in terms of uh, medication you know administering medication or um, and I wouldn't really say that they know how to clean wounds I mean it's really basic what they do like cleaning with um, soap and water and putting a, band, a bandage on. So it's more kind of like physical care, but for sure it's, I mean, and that's, that's something that was really difficult for me as a child and for a lot of people in the religion was there were so many ambiguities and so many arbitrary rules. So for instance, it was okay to go and have a broken bone set, um, but it wasn't okay to receive cancer treatment or, in, or actually in my own personal um, experience. I have a family member who um, who had a tumor behind her eye and tried to pray to heal that tumor until it got to the point that she had to have a surgery and she lost the sight in that eye. But yet it was okay to wear prescription eyeglasses. And so it's that kind of arbitrariness of expecting someone to be able to heal a tumor behind your eye, but that it's okay to not heal uh, being short-sightedness or, or what, like whatever the, um, so I'm not sure that I'm really answering um, your question. When I, when I was growing up, the whole vaccine thing was really anxiety producing for me because basically I was going against the mainstream in a huge way, in a much bigger way than I would say than today, because in the 1970s, doctors were absolutely revered. And so, um, and that's why my classmates just found it so astounding. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm vaccinated now and I, and I believe in vaccination, but um, I also know what it's like to kind of stand on the other side of, of a mainstream belief and how alienating uh, that can be. We've got a number of questions coming up here, so let's um, try to get through as many as we can. The, uh, the next one is from Ray Lebeau, who says, in your article, one of your comments that jumped out at me was, we, we mistakenly assume that if we know why something happened in the past, we can prevent it in the future. If we could learn from the past, change some of our belief systems and move, oh, if only, sorry, if only we could learn from our, from the past, change some of our belief systems and move forward in a more harmonious and loving environment. This is not a question, it's more of a comment. Do you have any response? Well, I think that that part was, was more about how as a species, like we always need to have a story and a reason for why everything happens. And so in my religion, I was, I was, you know, given a certain structure of how the world works. And then when the world didn't work that way, 
there was kind of nowhere to go with it. So on in, in our church, we had this plaque on the wall in the Sunday school that said divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. And at first that sounded great. But then even as a young child, you could start seeing how, well, what about that air airplane crash that just happened and all those people that just died, how is God meeting their needs? So, um, so I think that what I, what I gained from reading that book was an appreciation for the idea of, of randomness, which, in the, which was completely opposite to what, what I was brought up in. I was brought up in you know, this idea that God is absolutely in control. Everything is harmonious, God is in control, and we don't talk about luck or accidents, and that at a spiritual level, they never happen. Okay. We'll have, uh, we're going to take just one more question and then we'll move on. But um, actually, Natika has it. If, if we can do it in about a minute, that would be great. <laughs> okay, my name is Natika. <laughs> okay. I was, I just really appreciate what you're talking about. And I, it resonates with me, even um, as an Indigenous person, that idea of praying more and things will happen. And I'm thinking about mental health awareness as well, and even accessibility in churches. And one of the things, like how, you know, what, and I'm excited for Andrea's, um, what she's about to present, because I think she's changed some accessibility to church, like uh, worship time. But I'm, I'm just thinking too, I don't know anything about um, Christian science, but one of the things that I often speak up against, even though I love pastoral care, I often say it's not the same as counseling. It's not the same as other resources. And that idea that I was talking about the medicine wheel, medicine is very physical and it's missing the mental, spiritual and emotional components. So I, I just wanted to say, I guess this isn't a question, but that I, it all, as I'm writing, as you're talking, I'm writing notes, I'm going, yes, like, this is a huge issue and I look forward to seeing some of this deconstructed and, and reweave. Like I think we're in a rupture right now. But anyway, that's another topic. But <laughs> thank you so much, Louise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. It's uh, wonderful to hear from you. Uh, we're going to move now to Andrea Irwin. Andrea is the Digital Minister for Highland United in Vancouver and helps congregations create great digital ministries with Pacific Mountain Regions United Online. Her book, which is called Following Embodied Discipleship in a Digital Age, came out in August. And in our September issue, Andrea was interviewed by Christopher White about the book and the important ideas in it. So please welcome Andrea. Thank you. Good afternoon or on the West Coast here or good evening for those of you who are out on the East. I am speaking to you from Vancouver on the territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations, the Coast Salish people. And I'm really grateful to be here with you this evening, just sharing a few extra words about digital ministry. Uh, some of you might be very sick of hearing the words digital ministry by now, and others of you, this might be a fairly new topic, especially if uh, church is not what brings you to Broadview magazine. But I was uh, given the opportunity to have a conversation um, or what ended up turning into several conversations with, with Reverend Christopher White about what it means to do digital ministry well and how online ministries have changed in this pandemic time and what they might look like moving forward. We have heard a lot lately about what's been called um, a hybrid model of worship or uh, as as it was reframed for me throughout some conversations I've, I've now started calling it an integrated worship model and when uh, Reverend White and I first spoke several months ago this was something that people were really just starting to consider the realities of so we'd moved past the point where this was something that was just going to get us through to when we could start worshiping in person again and all of a sudden we started approaching the reality of this idea that our communities of faith we don't need to do double duty and offer two separate ministry options but we can in fact continue to offer some of our online ministries um, while remaining one 
worshiping community. So perhaps larger, and Natika, you um, used the word accessible, which is such a huge part of this work, is how can we be more accessible to people? How can the church show up where other people are? Um, and also sustainable. This ministry is a way that um, can help our churches find ways to sustain themselves in ways that we had not previously imagined. So I think this idea of integration or of being fully ourselves, whether that's us as individuals or us as church communities is really what got me interested in this idea of authentic online ministry uh, and, and certainly led to the work that Jason Biasi and I did on the book that we wrote. Um, this is work that I began doing before COVID made the work mandatory. Uh, and I saw it as important really for two reasons. And the first was that piece of accessibility and more so um, at the time, I really was passionate about progressive Christianity having a bigger presence in the world and the internet, whether we like it or not, um, is a permanent fixture and permanent means of communication right now. And so I think that uh, I just started out by thinking that it would serve the church really well to be fluent in this area. Um, but then second and, and more importantly, I was as someone whose background was in communications, I was so tired of hearing people question as whom and how they should exist in, in the online space, as if who we are in one space is entirely different than who we are in another. And I think that living an embodied and integrated life, so that's one in which we show up with integrity and authenticity and vulnerability in all of the places we arrive, that is such a core Christian value. And that doesn't mean that we don't necessarily take on different attitudes in different spaces or with people. And it doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. And it doesn't mean that we need to share our stories with people who can't maybe yet be trusted with them. But it does mean that the way we walk through the world should be the same as how we walk through our online spaces. And that's a message that I felt the church had a really unique position to share both for our leaders and for those of us growing as disciples in this space. And I think that all too, all too often we see people exist as disintegrated individuals in our online spaces. So this is why we have trolls because you can't see their faces. People can say cruel things behind a screen to one another and it doesn't feel the same as if we were in person. Um, we have people who might be viewed by embodied society as loners, but who have you know, extremely meaningful connections with people online that they've never met. We have ministers who think that they should have one Facebook account for their church life and one for their personal life, or churches that think that sticking a camera at the back of the sanctuary and then ignoring it is doing online ministry. And all of this is a very disintegrated approach. Um, and it's not healthy. I think it's stripping, uh, you know, to borrow Brene Brown's phrase, I think it's stripping us of our wholehearted living. I think that we need to arrive to our online spaces as the same people who walk through the world. And that's not being perfect. That's not being poised. That's not being polished. Um, but that's being real because our very real selves are the ones who Christ calls and who Christ has commissioned to go into the world and go into all of the nations. And, and I don't think that the internet is exempt from that from that commission. And so I think that there was that curiosity and belief that really started this work. And what I found was that the approach of integrated living to the internet was really helpful when it came to our churches existing in that place too. So who are you as a church community when people Google you versus who are you as a church community when people show up and walk through the doors of your building? Um, and I think that this you know past 16 months or 18 months how what is time anymore uh, i think that it's taught us that this kind of genuine presence is not something that is simple it's not a plug and play ministry it takes constant attention and tending to so whether we're on zoom or whether we're broadcasting to youtube we have to be able to attend to these spaces and so that's the conversation that I was really glad to have um, with Christopher in the context of this interview. Um, and that's the conversation that I've been having uh, with multiple worshiping communities um, multiple times a day uh, across the country as they really prepare to worship in this new way. So who are you in person and how can you now be that for more people in, in an online space and realizing that you know, everything is changing still, and we don't yet know what we've learned. Um, and also that technology changes so fast. I, I think that one of 
the most powerful things we've learned or that I've learned doing this work over the past 18 months is that in regards to digital ministry and the church in general, when it is necessary, we do actually have the strength and the desire and the willingness to change. And I know that that's a conversation that is hard in, in our churches. Um, but when it comes down to it, our fear actually isn't holding us back from being faithful. And the work is frustrating and it is very experimental and it is tiring. We have this conversation about the capacity of our leaders so often um, and we're not going to get it right and it's not going to be perfect. And we do it because it's what has been asked of us. And I'm hopeful um, that after this very liminal time that we've been living in, that there's something new and emerging here, a new, a new way of being the church um, that will bring people closer to one another and closer to God than was fathomable for, for a certain demographic before. So um, that's the conversation that Chris and I had and that has changed in the two months since we had the conversation and will continue to change <laughs> yes. uh, on an hour by hour basis if my email inbox is any indication. I so know there. we're also trying to figure out all kinds of digital strategies for Broadview and it just seems like once we get one thing thought through then this, the next thing's already popped up but yeah. uh, we've got a question here from Mary Leslie. She says, I was interested in your comment that Zoom did not lend itself to a hybrid model. Can you talk about the alternative and are they more expensive? Important question and challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the resources are, are a separate conversation. There are lots of organizations that are um, putting grants together that are helping people fund the technology. So don't be put off by that. Um, I would say the reason that Zoom is not the best from a hybrid or an integrated perspective is solely because it can be so jarring to be present in a room in two very different ways with one another. Um, I know Natika and I know each other from BST and uh, Natika has had the experience of being a distance student. And you always have that moment when you speak as a distance student, what you don't know Natika is that your face is six Feet, six feet wide and your voice like comes into the classroom at like twice the level that everyone else's voice does. And so there is this, um, what we're really trying to avoid is the sense that there is an other. We all want to be in this together. And so if you think about putting a laptop in the corner of a church sanctuary in the corner of a boardroom, um, if everyone's just milling about in front of the laptop, then all of a sudden you're not engaging the people who are on the screen. So, so that's just, it's just something to be attentive to. Um, you can use Zoom as, as a starting place for a hybrid model to experiment with whether or not it's what your community is looking for. And that is a very uh, resource responsible approach. Um, but I would suggest in the future a streaming platform because you can manage the spaces in different ways while they're still communicating with one another. Okay. Um, I'm skimming through what I'm seeing is more comments um, than questions, I think. Um, just people talking to you. Maybe you can stick around after and, and hear more about uh, what people are doing. I'm just going to hop in with a question is, do you have an example of a church that's really doing it right and doing great stuff that you could tell us about? Yeah, I, I have a lot and so I feel really bad naming any of them, but um, there's, well, we won't say it's the best one. Um, White Horse United Church uh, is one of the things that has really impressed me is just how many communities that don't have a lot of resources that don't have the technology um, that they've found really innovative ways to do online ministry well. And one of the things that this community did was they started on Facebook Live every night doing a story hour. And so it was something that the community could gather around in a social media space that was separate from the church, but that was something that they could connect on in between Sunday to Sunday, which is some one of the things that we're missing so much is that what do we do from Monday to Saturday? Even if we have online church, that's not keeping us connected. And so that's one of the ways that their church kind of expanded into the online space um, and, and did something they never would have imagined doing before. Uh, we also have people using lots of older technology. We have people who have very poor internet who are doing digital ministry by radio broadcasting or by, I didn't know that these existed, um, because I guess I was too young at the time, but something called party lines, which are just a phone that you pick up and everyone in the neighborhood can hear what's happening on the line. People are putting those in their pulpits now so they can just pick up their phone, they can talk to them and people in the neighborhood can pick up their phone and, and be in touch with people. Um, lots of our, one of the things that a lot of our communities have been missing is eating together. Um, we have churches that have wanting to support local during this time. They'll put a call out to a local restaurant, warn them that a bunch of people are gonna come by with 
takeout orders. They'll all go and pick up their food in a staggered way from the restaurants and bring them back and then eat together in, in a Zoom space and, and pray and worship together that way. Um, and, and I think that the most exciting piece for me is um, uh, communities of faith who are choosing to no longer be in competition with one another, but to collaborate with one another. And that's where I've seen um, entire church communities go from thinking that they were a dying church community to feeling like they can maintain their own identity and, and really start to flourish again, just in the collaboration that the technology has, has afforded us with. Fascinating. Um, okay, Natika has a question and then we will wrap it up. Go ahead, Natika. First of all, I didn't know that, Andrea, <laughs> about my face being six <laughs> feet tall. I'm never asking a question again. But um, I was just thinking, because um, I've attended your church a lot uh, in the before, and it was amazing. And I think I called it like side talking, because you, you were always moderating the chat box. And it was interesting because I can't multitask very well, but I, I'm just thinking I, I have to read your book because I'm thinking about that for our own church. But what I found interesting about a month ago, so first of all, I love being at home for church because I find we still use pews and they're kind of uncomfortable. Um, I can just be more productive. I have a 10 year old, you know, um, but it was interesting because there was a comment that, where are you guys? You're not at church. And I was like, I don't think I've ever been so engaged at church because that, because what's shifted, online is first of all I put my headphones on so I look sometimes but mm -hmm. I feel like it's more interactive like I'm moving I'm integrating it whereas in the church it feels more like that older model of being passive and sort of filling that empty vessel that old teaching model mm -hmm. and and you know like I wonder like how how do you respond because I'm sure you've heard that over and over and i'm not in vancouver i'm in Calgary. So, so. yeah yeah like, it is um, fun? I, yeah thank you it's um First of all, I, I love what you mentioned about being able to worship in a way that works for you. I think just like we have different learning styles, we all have different worshiping styles. And while some people don't get it, this really works for others. Um, but the the comment that you hear, you know, why don't you go to church anymore? Well, I do go to church. You're just not seeing me. This this brings it back to the key argument of online ministry, which is we want we aren't talking about doing ministry in one way in this place and ministry in in real life in our churches in another in lots of cases it is perfectly reasonable to keep those two ministries separate but when communities coming out of covid are talking about a hybrid model this is exactly what they're talking about and so what it comes down to is we want to be able to see one another. So I need to know on a Sunday to Sunday basis that Natika is one of the people who's at church at home. And you need to know that Andrea is one of the people who is at church in the building. And so how do we make those conversations happen? And that can be, yes, the chat box. You can have your rotation of in-person volunteers in your YouTube chat box talking to people so you see those names. But it's also a really beautiful opportunity to have lay leadership like we've never had before and invite you to offer a reading on Sunday from the comfort of your couch so that the people in the sanctuary can see you and to invite people that wouldn't normally read on a Sunday morning in the pews to stand up and offer the reading so that you can see them. Can we make sure that your name and your prayer requests are read out loud along with the rest of them? Can we welcome you? I mean, most of our communities, we're not talking about having hundreds of people online and hundreds of people in the building. We're talking about, unfortunately, we'll get there. <laughs> but, but I think we're talking about, you know, a handful of individuals. And it's very reasonable for me to stand up on a Sunday morning and say, Natika and James and Sharon and Louise and Rebecca, it's so great to see you here today. And people, you know, when you leave the service and you bless people and send them out, can you say, who didn't you see today? And can you reach out to them? over the course of the week. And so those are ways that we can continue educating people that actually not being physically present doesn't mean you're not present. That's a great spot to end it. Um, I hope that everybody uh, can pick up your book. I obviously like listening to you, there's so many great ideas. And I, it's fascinating to me that you started this before the pandemic because the relevance of it just skyrocketed uh, since then. And uh, everybody's, everybody's talking about it. I know among our readers, we get lots of uh, feedback about that kind of thing. So 
really happy to have you here. And um, Sharon will post a, a link to the book and the discount code again. Um, I just want to thank uh, everybody for being here, especially Natika, Louise, and Andrea, who volunteered their time to make this event possible. And again, thank you to our sponsor, the United Church Bookstore. So we're super grateful to all of you. Tomorrow, we'll be sending you a short survey by email so you can share your thoughts with us about this event. And on Wednesday, we'll send you a short email from the United Church Bookstore, our sponsor, which will again include the discount code uh, to purchase Andrea's book. If you don't capture it tonight, that's okay. We got you. Um, Broadview's online reading club is a free event, but it does cost us $2,700 per year for the Zoom plan that can handle a group event of this size. If you're already a donor to Broadview, thank you. Your donations, your donations help us continue to feature exceptional people like Natika Bach, Louise Kinross, and Andrea Irwin. If you're not a donor, please consider making a small donation for tonight's event. Even five or $10 would help us out a lot. And Sharon will post a link for donations in the chat. Uh, and we'll also include a donations link in tomorrow's survey. Um, Following the conclusion of tonight's event, uh, I invite those who are interested to remain on this call for an informal discussion time. If you had more questions or thoughts that you wanted to share with our speakers, uh, please, please stick around for uh, a little while afterwards. Otherwise, if you're heading out, thank you again for being here. Be well, and we hope to see you back for our next online reading club, which is October 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And that's when we will discuss the October, November issue. So good night for those who are leaving and I'll still be here for a little while for those who are sticking around. See you soon. So I guess we can start talking as people are leaving, can we, Jocelyn? Sure, yeah, jump on in. Yeah, I was just, just okay. skimming the chat because I'd missed some of it and uh, I wanted to make sure that the links got up there. I haven't seen them yet. Sharon, are you posting links? Yep, okay. Okay, um, Andrea, I really, Adria, I really enjoyed your, your article and I will look forward to, to perusing your book if I can. And I'm in a small semi-rural church, um, St. John's United in Saanich North. Um, on the, near Vancouver, on Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting because I came into this community during COVID. And the blessing was that I could see everybody's names on the screen. I could see everybody's faces. I wasn't looking at the backs of heads. Yeah. And I could check them out without showing who I was a little bit if I needed to. But also when I, we first, we've had two social events, well, more than that, but I've been able to go to two we realized some people were craving the contact. So we have coffee hour after the service in the yard. So that means, you know, a couple of hours later. So the people who feel comfortable doing that can do it, but the people who still feel anxious about being in public, and BC has very high COVID rates right now, can, you know, are fine. They had the service and that's it. So I'm, I'm you know, it was interesting for me to be able to go to one of these in person and have memorized the names so that I wasn't going in as a complete stranger. <laughs> but I, I think there's lots about technology that we all still have to learn. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful that you're opening that door in a bigger way. Thank you. And, and I think you're right. There's um, something that we will all miss um, that we might not even realize we'll miss in just how intimate Zoom settings are. Like I know more about you right now just because I can see what's in the background of your Zoom call and I'm this close to your face than I would if you were in the same environment as everyone else. And so you do get to know if, you know, if Natika's little puppy is running around and distracting her, I get to see that part of her and that piece of her life and the photos on the wall behind you. I can ask you to talk to me about those and their entrance ways into conversation that um, I think we've had because we've been able to, to meet this way that we wouldn't have in our churches. And so I think that there is a lot to learn about how to recultivate that sense of intimacy with these people that will be meeting meeting because who we are going to be meeting, whether we've known them for years or not, are not the same people that we left church with. 
16 months ago. So like life has continued to happen for all of us. And so cultivating that sense of um, really close connection uh, in a very different environment is going to be really interesting. I had someone say the other day, they're not looking forward to the fact that they're going to have to listen to everyone sniffing and sneezing in the middle of a sermon, because right now we can control our environment. So I know who's around me uh, and I know what sounds are being made. But as soon as you're sitting in a sanctuary with, you know, 20 to 100 people, um, there's a lot more that's going on. So I think that it will be a very interesting adjustment, but that there are some things that um, we might never go back from. And I'm glad. I'm curious to know, Andrea, you worked with Jason Biasi on this uh, book and uh, in the promo blurb, it talks about you being a Gen Z and him being a Gen X. I'm a Gen X. Just wondering how that, how that collaboration worked for you guys. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. So Jason and I um, approached it as very much as a dialogue. Um, he will joke and call himself a Luddite, although he's not, um, but he's very much, uh, when it comes to some of our theology, the practice of communion is one in particular that we have butted heads on from the beginning. And we just gave ourselves full permission in the writing of this book to have that conversation. And so you really get to look at what a conversation like Natika's question, how do you respond to people that say, you know, this isn't real or, or something like that. And that really is us, how we've written the book. So you can hear how some of that conversation um, is modeled. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we learned a lot about one another and both grew in the opposite direction. I was ready to run away to a hermitage when we finished writing the book and Jason like upped his Twitter game. So, you know, I think that, I think that it was a learning experience for both of us and the work is really richer because it had, it had two voices. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Louise, one question I was going to ask you, and I didn't get a chance. I just want to throw it out there now is, well, it wasn't really a question, but you had a great anecdote in your story that we had to cut for space. And I don't know if you remember which one I'm talking about, uh, but we just, um, you know, you get 4,000 words, 3,000 words, and we have to, we have to just adapt <laughs> to the limits of uh, print. But um, it was the story about when you went to the uh, doctor with a sprain. Yeah, so um, I'm just noticing, I, I'm not usually doing, I'm in my office, and I, I, I realize that I'm not, I think I look really dark on the screen, and I don't really know what to When you do. come forward a bit, you're brighter if you if that helps. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, you're good, you're good. So yeah, so that story was um, that I, I had gone to the park, and I, we had, the, we had a, a rocket ship structure and I climbed to the top of it and I somehow got my arm stuck in it and then I fell to the ground and I had sprained my arm really badly and when I got home and was very upset my dad um, took me to the ER and we had to wait for hours there and it was it was always um, like I love the fact that my dad always kind of had a practical approach so if he thought something was serious he he would make sure that we were attended to, but it created a lot of conflicting feelings. And so when the doctor finally came and started examining me, he kept moving that arm into different positions and then asking each time, does it hurt? And, and I, like my tears were just streaming down my face, but I kept insisting every time, no, no. And I think it was almost like, I was probably making him a little bit angry because he could probably see that there was something wrong with my arm, but I was insisting so strongly on saying no, because even at that age, I knew that I couldn't have a healing if I believed in pain. So I, I felt like I couldn't um, verbally um, acknowledge that I was in pain. Hmm. So incredible. When you, I'm wondering what your family now, your relationship with them, and also how you, when you think back to, you know, your parents uh, educated you in this religion, how you interpret that and, and your family relations now, just how do you think about that? Um, I guess something, I, something that maybe hasn't come through in, in, in how I wrote about it or, or how I've been talking about it tonight is that my parents were completely loving people and, and I had, and being in our church as a child was a really positive experience because the people were 
so caring and um and 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 always conveyed the value of um of all of us and and we kind of got our identity through that so it wasn't in any way a callous experience um they people that are in that religion really believe that prayer can heal um but then you kind of come up against these situations where where it doesn't work and then unfortunately the only person who um is blamed is yourself because we believe it's as a result of our thoughts so my dad um um died quite a few years ago now um and my mom is still alive um and is still um associated with the church although doesn't actually attend um and i think because she was born into it um it she's never really been able to reject it Hmm. um so i think i also tried to get that across in the story is that when you're born into something like that it becomes part of your identity and you can't really separate it from you as a person and in rejecting it you kind of feel like you're rejecting um a part of yourself did, did you read um, my, my brothers sorry my brothers are not my brothers rejected it much earlier than i did and i i i'm glad for them because they didn't go through actually trying to prove it and demonstrate it and that was really challenging okay go ahead yeah uh, ann go ahead louise i was an occupational therapist at blue Review children's hospital in the oh. 70s Oh my goodness. So way back. And so I'm aware of what the social and physical barriers were at that time in terms of integrating disabled children into the community. I've been out of the field for many, many years. So I'm curious that you're still bringing up the, the social and physical barriers. And I'm wondering what specifically are you working on at the present time? So much to me, being out of the field looks like it's changed for disabled people, but you obviously are still on the issue. You know, I would say, and, and maybe I'm very cynical, but I've been here for over 20 years and I feel like so many of the problems are still very, very real for our families. So I'm just even thinking about kids going back to school now, um, kids that have that are that have you know complex medical problems and that require a nurse to go to school well right now in Ontario um, all of these families that have been told that there's a nursing shortage so their child just isn't going to school or their child instead of going five days a week is going to go three days a week um, and, and it's the kind of thing where if that were to happen to the general population parent like I it just wouldn't even be possible but for some reason that's okay for kids the disabilities um, there I mean there are just so many huge problems we have, we have a, um, a campaign going and right now we're focused on um, ending ableism so um, just how th throughout our culture is this idea that um, you know quote-unquote being able-bodied is the ideal and that um, and that the whole medical model of disability as being lesser than and people being inferior. Um, and there are all kinds of studies that have been done even in the last year showing um, even, for instance, in medical fields, um, there was a big study, implicit association study done in the United States that showed that, um, that, that doctors there and healthcare workers there at, have this implicit bias against people with disabilities so at an unconscious automatic level they prefer people who don't have disabilities and so you kind of think about how that actually then seeps into the kind of care they provide um, so i think i mean they're just there are still huge problems for kids with disabilities especially in terms of the education system everything is still a fight um, i think in some ways the culture likes to think that, that we're much more progressive and that we accept um, kids with disabilities. Um, but there's still many studies being done showing how socially isolated kids with disabilities are and that often at an elementary level we, where we have put more time into trying to include kids with disabilities, there have been improvements, but then as soon as you get to high school, 
um, they all fall apart. And, um, and those kids, especially with severe disabilities, just become more and more isolated. Um, so, you know, I wish Thank I could you. be more positive about it, but if anything, being in it for this many years, another thing that, that I've noticed is that ever since I came here, we've been having these studies about um, parents of kids with disabilities having high rates of depression and anxiety. And we've had dozens and dozens of these studies, but we're not actually studying interventions to actually help. So we just keep churning out these studies showing, you know, showing that this is a fact for, for many parents of kids with disabilities, but um, there hasn't been a lot of action. I mean, there's, there are some things that are happening now, but it's still a really big problem. Thank you. And I'm really glad that you used to work here. <laughs> Thank you. It was a good experience. Yeah, it's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. The people are exceptional here, I, I feel. I agree. Anybody else, just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Um, I don't need to direct unless you want me to, but... <laughs> Oh, thank you. Because Bloom is awesome. Thanks. Well, seeing no other comments, um, I think we could wrap up a very wonderful evening, very enriching, as somebody said, and really interesting, a nice cross section of people, as always, very different topics. And uh, I'm just very pleased to see so many people came and had great questions and comments and uh, showing a lot of enthusiasm. So we'll, uh, we'll hope to see you again at the next one. And until then, um, you know, have a great, I, I don't wanna say have a great fall yet, but I guess that's what I need to say. So have a great early fall and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Take care everybody, have a great night. Thank you. Bye.